So let's talk about the strongest forces that the Tomb Worlds can bring to bear, with a look at three of the strongest Necron army lists around. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd take a look at some of the strong Necron army lists that seem to have been making an impact in tournaments. Necrons have largely been middling to bad for the vast majority of 9th edition, but following the Nephilim update and all the balanced data slate changes, they really do seem to have gone to a whole new level. Certainly one of the stronger factions in the game, and are having quite a lot of good success at events, with a lot of people bringing their Necrons out to play, and they do seem to be having some fairly good success. In the video we'll take a look at three lists that have placed fairly highly at tournaments, take a look at what units are being run, and why they might work a bit better than before with the new version of Necrons. First up we have a rather shooting heavy list, this by Chris Kinnair who used it to take first at Beast in the East Midlands, a bunch of Necron firepower units backed up by a couple of Catan and the Silent King. The list is organised into a spearhead detachment, supreme command and auxiliary support. Necron armies can afford to be a little bit more heavy on the detachments compared with a lot of other forces, as most lists seem to be including the Silent King these days, giving you 3 command points extra compared with most other lists, allowing you to use things like spearheads or vanguards if you want to. I believe that this list would start on 2 command points in Nephilim, so technically this one's making spends that a lot of other armies wouldn't be able to without an extra rule to get them more CP. First up we'll start with the Silent King, who Games Workshop really seemed to have made into pretty much an auto-include for Necrons, just about every single competitive list is running him at the moment. With all the core changes, a points cut and some other buffs, Mr Zarek seems to be just too good to pass up for the vast majority of armies. He clocks in at 400 points, is pretty threatening both at range and in melee, gives 4 rerolls to hit at range and 4 rerolls to wound in melee, plus double my will be done. He can deny a power, make enemy units fight last, mess around with your command protocols if needed, and of course gives the army an extra 3 command points, which means that they can take all sorts of different attachments and extra warlord traits and relics if desired. All sorts of advantages, and he gives himself his own rerolls due to the core keyword now. It really does seem that you just can't go too far wrong with him. He's always going to cause your opponents problems and make your own units more dangerous. Getting on to the rest of the army and Mr. Kinnair's list makes good use of easily the most common competitive combo with that obsec type dynasty. The custom combination of Relentlessly Expansionist and Eternal Conquerors, a 6 inch pre-game move and objective secured on everything bar the Catan. Both of those things give you a massive leg up on the primary game, getting Necron units where they need to be, and also help them achieve their very easy to do secondaries, where you can get a long way just by holding down a couple of objectives in the midfield for a turn or two. Between the combination of being really strong on primary objectives and also on secondaries, it means that most of the time enemies need to be very aggressive when they're fighting Necrons, as usually their easy access to victory points is going to mean that a close game is usually going to be slightly tipped in the Necron favour. In any case, unit wise most of this is rather fast and rather shooting. The spearhead is led by a Technomancer with a Canoptic Cloak, they're fast moving and can resurrect slain models such as the Locust Destroyers if needed, and potentially repair Necron vehicles with that cloak as well. He also has the Veil of Darkness as well for teleporting a unit across the board, my guess would be that that might well be the Locust Destroyers. They seem like the single best target for it, as I don't think that you could use it on the Silent King as they aren't the same dynasty. Then the list uses literally no troops whatsoever, going very heavy on the fast attack and heavy support. First up, two squads of Tomb Blades with the Particle Beamers, kept nice and cheap at 60 points. These guys move very fast and have pretty efficient anti-infantry firepower for the cost, pretty good units for going and claiming those objectives. There's then a trio of Annihilation Barges with Gauss Cannons, it's pretty cool to see these being run to good effect, as they haven't really been seeing all that much play for Necrons throughout the rest of the edition. My guess is that they'll be hovering around with the Silent King getting 4 rerolls to hit, and with all the Tesla you could potentially be rerolling everything and trying to fish for those 6s, each one gives you 2 additional hits. That means you'd be averaging around about 11 or 12 strength 7 AP nothing damage one shots on most targets, so at least that'll be stacking a fair few saves, never mind what the Gauss Cannons do. Then we've got a unit of 7 Locust Destroyers, it seems to be a really popular pick at the moment to have a really big squad like this, again a unit that until the points changes didn't really see all that much play. With the Silent King's My Will Be Done you could be hitting on 2s re-rolling 1s, and then potentially use that Extermination Protocol stratagem for re-rolling or wound rolls, making those Gauss Cannons pretty effective anti-everything weapons with 3 shots and D3 damage apiece. Interesting to see the Heavy Destroyer taking it an Enmity Exterminator as well, the more anti-infantry version, in general I've usually seen a lot more people taking the Gauss. Finally, besides the Catan, there's two more single Locust Heavy Destroyers, 
one with the Enmity Exterminator, one with Gauss, I guess either opportunistic firepower or really cheap units to take backfield objectives maybe, and then two big scary threats in the Catan, one Catan Shard of the Void Dragon that takes the Sky of Falling Stars plus his generic power, and then the Nightbringer who takes Transdimensional Thunderbolt in addition to his Gaze of Death. Having two Catan to take down is pretty problematic for some armies if they can't deal damage in multiple phases or they can't get lines of sight to them. The Void Dragon will absolutely ruin vehicle armies, not too bad when knights are about, and the Nightbringer is a rather nice answer to anything that can't take more than three wounds in a phase, a good counter to other Catan, really tough stuff, or maybe Abaddon the Despoiler. Overall, it's really quite an interesting and different list. The Silent King and the relentlessly expansionist and eternal conquerors does seem to be fairly standard for strong Necron lists at the moment, but it's fun to see the rest of the army dedicated to gunline units and Catan. Moving on to our second list, I thought this one was interesting as an entry that doesn't just use relentlessly expansionist and eternal conquerors, and this list by Joel Wilson was used to take second at the Palm Springs GT, and instead makes use of a very destroyer heavy Nihilac list. This one's built around a Vanguard Elite Heavy Detachment, plus the Supreme Command for the near mandatory Silent King. And it is kind of interesting to see Nihilac played instead of Relentlessly Expansionist. You're basically trading out that pre game move for a combination of different things, ignoring AP 1 in your own deployment zone, the Eternal Guardian Protocol being amped up a bit, and a stratagem that allows you to shoot while doing an action. I guess that's kind of relevant with the Necron Secondaries. Again, as the default centre of the list, we've got the Silent King with his command points, buff rolls, and massive great big annihilator beams, and I'm going to guess that he's going to be buffed by Illuminor Seraz, who now is a core unit, can both give the Silent King an augmentation roll, the chance to get plus one toughness on the Silent King is pretty mad, and also I believe that currently he can resurrect those Triarchal Maneers, I'm not sure if he was being used that way when he was played with this list, but at the moment I believe it checks out rules as written to me. Besides that, at least he packs a little bit of range and melee threat as well, he can reanimate two different things per turn, so if two squads take casualties, then all well and good, and just in general, he's a pretty strong character to have around. Finally, the third HQ in the list is a Chronomancer with the Entropic Lance and Veil of Darkness, a 5 plus invul protection for a unit, plus being able to jump them around the table. Again, that could be very nice with the block of Locust Destroyers, or I guess in theory, if you're feeling like gambling some of the Scorpet Destroyers, that they wouldn't be all that guaranteed to make the charges. From there, we get onto the squads. And perhaps the biggest standout feature of the list is three very big blocks of Scorpec Destroyers, three units of six of them, and one of those three units is supported by a Plasma Sight. These guys would make it very intimidating to try and get into the midfield, a massive ton of high AP, high damage melee attacks coming in there, potentially with rerolls to wound if they can get the Silent King in with buff range, and one unit a turn could use that Whirling Death stratagem, the one that gives them minus one to wound and makes them hard to take out. Lots of other good options as well, including plus one strength, plus the extra nastiness that that plasma site can bring. Then there's a big block of Lich Guard with Sword and Shield, seem like a solid choice for marching up the board alongside the Silent King. They're quite likely to survive enemy shooting, so it could be a target for the resurrection from Illuminor Zeraz as well. Two cheap units of Scarabs that'd be great for snaggy objectives with their objective secures. That big block of Locust Destroyers, including one with a Gauss Destructor, Again, a huge shooting threat with plus one to hit and rerolls everything from extermination protocols to lay waste to something big. And then a unit of Locust Heavy Destroyers or the Gauss Destructors, three big 3d3 damage shots there. Finally, there's a couple of Crypto Thralls, slot free because of the Cryptex. They could either be used to add a little bit more punch to anyone going too near Zeraz or the Chronomancer, or just be used as cheap obsec chaff. They could hold down a home objective for very, very little points investment indeed. Overall, it looks like a pretty hideously destructive Necron list there. So many threats that you just really can't ignore. Any one unit of those Scorpet Destroyers making its way into something important is likely to cause some crazy damage. Pretty fun to see Destroyer-heavy Necrons being a viable choice on the table. Finally, I thought we'd take a look at a rather fun Flayed Ones and Scarabs heavy list. This one run by an Isaac Sharp, who used it to take third at Salt City GT. Again, like the others, some of the auto include staples are there straight away. Again, there's the Silent King for all that he brings, plus Relentlessly Expansionist and Eternal Conquerors, which very much is the go-to for the vast majority of Necron lists out there. Then, alongside the Silent King is a Catacomb Command Barge with the Voltaic Staff, Tesla Cannon, and the Enduring Will Warble trait. He's really quite shooty in himself, and could maybe help out the Silent King if they took that secondary for Nobles killing units. Enduring Will is the trait that makes him just a little bit more survivable, minus one damage on the barge, layered with Quantum Shielding. 
Then there's a Chronomancer with an Aeon Stave. Again, 5 plus Invuls and Reroll charges. They take the Veil of Darkness and the Immortal Pride Warlord trait. Immortal Pride gives you a little defense against mortal wounds and also prevents bad combat attrition modifiers. Seems a bit of a curious choice to me. I'm not sure if that's trying to counter Chaos Knights or something. Then moving on to the squads, this is the first list today that uses some troops. It's set up in a battalion detachment, so it has one unit of 20 warriors with Gauss Reapers, one unit of 10 which takes a Ghost Dart transport, and one unit of 5 Immortals with Gauss for some fairly cheap objective scoring. I'd guess that the big unit of 20 will probably be Veil of Darknessing with the Chronomancer, a pretty tried and tested combo with a good inball save and getting lots of bodies where they need to be. There's then three units of five flayed ones. As the objective secured, I believe that they'd be quite a good choice for doing that retrieve Nephilim data secondary. A couple of big blocks of Scorpet destroyers, one unit of six and one unit of three. Again, pretty excellent with that one command point stratagem for minus one to wound and Silent King rerolls if you can get them. Then two really big blocks of Scarab Swarms, one unit of eight and one unit of nine. They'd have a serious amount of wounds for gumming up the midfield objectives and could be another very good choice for putting the Chronomancer's 5 plus Invul save on. And then finally a small unit of 3 Wraiths can bully some light infantry units and are also at least fairly tanky. Overall the list looks like it'd be incredibly durable, lots and lots of bodies to clog up the midfield and loads of annoying objective security units getting where they need to be early and a few scary punchy units hidden within in those Scorpet destroyers and of course the big threat of the Silent King. I guess you might be able to take the No Prisoners secondary against this list. It seems you'd at least score fairly highly if you could take out those two units of Scarab Swarms, as they do have quite a lot of wounds. Certainly a very solid placing though, getting third overall. Good to know that big blocks of Warriors and Scarab Swarms can still cut the mustard if they need to. It's been fun to take a look at a few top Necron lists. It very much seems that the competitive community is in agreement that the Silent King is almost auto-include, and the Necrons are still great if you can take objectives secured on everything, that does seem to outweigh the advantages of damage buffs from things like Nervog and Mephrit, at least in the vast majority of lists doing well. Besides that though, it does look like a lot of different approaches are viable. Fast moving heavy firepower plus Katarn for one, perhaps slightly fragile but incredibly dangerous destroyers for another, and then slightly low damage obsec chaff all over the board still does work as well. In any case, let me know what you think of the armies, any insights as to how they were played are always appreciated, and any different thoughts or approaches that work for Necron Army lists right now. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I'm sure we'll have plenty more for the Necrons as we go on. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that down in the video description if you're interested. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.